from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 53, recorded on February 17, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome back. Is it, it is. Uh, Snow City up there yet? It is not. We are supposed to get rain. It's 50 degrees today. It's crazy. And then the, the temperature is <laughs> going to drop. It was like minus 10 the other day. It's just, it's that time of year where you don't know whether to wear a raincoat or a snow coat or what. It's been really very cold, right? Just like down here. Yeah, right? it has. Yeah. Yeah. Also Which is joining good for us skiing, from, but yeah, right. not the rain though. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to see everyone. Um, it is, it's 60 degrees outside and it's February. It's very strange. Wow, that is weird. Yeah, it's not going to last. <laughs> 17 here. Yeah, I felt like spring this morning, but it felt like spring two weeks ago and then boom, the next day it was freezing. And then it snowed, oh, so. Wow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to let you know that the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Louisiana State University Health in Shreveport would like to encourage people interested in pursuing graduate studies in the fall of 2022 to apply to their MS and PhD programs. They are a vibrant department of 16 faculty members working on a variety of DNA and RNA viruses, innate immunology, and intracellular bacteria such as Bordetella and Legionella. Located in northwestern Louisiana, they offer unique opportunities to grow personally and professionally milder winters <laughs> And Southern <laughs> Hospitality. Deadline for applications has been extended to March 1st. Uh, we will put a link to the department website in the show notes. It's clear that whoever wrote that must listen to the, these podcasts and know we like to talk about the weather. Yep. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, um, the author is a, uh, a, a former member of Kartik Chandran's lab at Einstein, who was a, is a big TWIV, et cetera, fan. And um, he's just moved to LSU Health. So congratulations. Cool. And uh, good luck. Yeah, it is a little warmer down there. Love it. <laughs> it's up here. Okay, let's dive in. Today, we do not have a guest, but we have us. And we are going to explore some interesting immunology. And uh, Cindy's going to walk us through it. Yeah, and we're missing Steph, which is unfortunate. But yeah, she had she had something else, emergency she had to take care of today. So we miss you, Steph, when you listen. Yes, we do. Um, so yes. yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I found this paper really interesting. Um, I When I started reading it, uh, particularly when I read the sort of summary and abstract, um, I felt somewhat skeptical. Um, <laughs> and, and then as I started to go through the data, they, they convinced me and I sort of realized that it was as cool as they were talking about as they had meant. So I thought that was really interesting. But at the beginning, I was like, no way. Um, I, I had the same reaction. <laughs> <laughs> so the paper that we're going to talk about is the title is called marginal zone B cells acquire dendritic cell functions by trogocytosis. And we have talked about trogocytosis before in one of the earlier um, episodes, uh, and I can't remember the name of it, but maybe you can look that up while we're talking. So the uh, senior author is Jose Berengos, and the first author is Patrick Shriek. Yes, is that That's how, would how I would say that. Okay. So first of all, that what was immune number 18. There we go. Immune number 18. Okay. The immunophiles discuss T-cell antigen discovery by trogocytosis. Yeah. So what is trogocytosis? Do you guys remember? The transfer of membrane patches among cells in close contact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you looked that up. <laughs> it's the title. It's the no, description of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so... So we think about cells and their membranes as being distinct, and they can come in contact with each other, and there's lots of reasons why they do that, especially immune cells, because they communicate really important information, and then we think that they pop apart. And the idea of trogocytosis is that sometimes one holds on a little bit tighter 
to that interaction and actually pulls things off the membrane of the other cell, which to me just blows my mind because energetically to be able to do that has to be incredibly hard. Right. And, but it happens. And I think the thing that sort of blows my mind as well is that it's one thing to think about this maybe happening. Uh, it's another thing to actually have things transfer and have this lead to a function. And so right. there being something useful, yes, happening right. out of this. So the useful thing here is that the title is marginal zone B cells acquire dendritic cell function. So the idea is dendritic cells present antigens. You know, they're, they're professional antigen presenting cells. That's what they do. And so they do that because they have MHC carrying peptide. We know that. And T cells interact with that. And B cells can present antigen too, but they present limited numbers of antigens. Really, mostly they... Uh, enhance what they're specific for, right? So whatever their B cell receptor binds, they pull in, they chew it up, and they present it. So they're going to present antigens that are associated with the thing that they recognize. And so that limits what they can actually present. And the idea here is that dendritic cells go around, they eat lots of things, and they can present lots of different things. And if B cells want to present those same things, they're just going to steal them from the dendritic cell. <laughs> And that was the crazy thing. And it's the the amazing thing is this is really predominantly, almost exclusively, these marginal zone B cells, which is just crazy. It's, they, they seem to be primed for this particular function. Yeah. So so the marginal zone B cells are mostly found in the spleen, um, in the, specifically right. the marginal zone region of the spleen. Um, and they tend to make... Um, a type of antibodies known as sort of natural antibodies um, that are often against polysaccharide components of uh, different microbes that um, may be sort of challenging um, to have T cell help um, in response to. And yet these cells make responses that sometimes look like they've had T cell help. In order to make that happen... Why, why, are, they, uh, why are they challenging to get T cell help? Um, <laughs> well, because they, they're the, the antibodies that they have are against these polysaccharide antigens, yeah. right? And in order to get T cell help, you have to present T cells something so that they can help you. I'm All talking right. so as these if are you're not a presented. B cell, yeah. right? So, and if you have right, carbohydrate antigens, it can't be presented. Right, they're carbohydrates. They're not chewed up and presented. You, you Got have it. to, the, the obligate thing, I'm sure there's a, rule break there somewhere because there always is for immunology. But the obligate uh, rule is that you have to be a protein-based thing okay. for the for a traditional alpha beta T cell receptor that recognizes MHC has to be a peptide. And, and so and MHC probably can't even present a carbohydrate, right? Right. No, it, it cannot. It, it can't present a carbohydrate. It might be able. There might be carbohydrates that might be attached to yeah, one of the sure. amino acids of a peptide, but yeah. um, in general, no. Okay, got it. Yeah, and yeah, but yet these B cells sometimes might uh, get want to have T cell help or might have functions that look like they have received T cell help, and it's yeah. hard to yeah. imagine how they would have the MHC on their surface to allow for that T cell help. And so the answer to that is these guys say they just steal it from the dendritic cell <laughs> just pluck it off but it but it doesn't just it doesn't just happen like that it's a very specific thing that amazingly also brings in complement and we've we've had a show on that as well and you can look that up while, while we're, we're talking here but we talked about complement in the brain and how that might be playing non-traditional functions but so what what this whole paper in a nutshell is saying is that <clears throat> Complement uh, has three main pathways that activate it. And we can go back to that. But, but there's a spontaneous pathway that in this paper they refer to as tick over. And that's how I learned it. But we pretty much just call it the alternative or spontaneous pathway. And so complement can react with proteins sort of nonspecifically. And there's lots of mechanisms for cells to prevent that from being maintained. So they inactivate complement, which is what they're going to talk about in this paper. But you can also pluck components of the complement back off with various different complement regulatory proteins. So having complement on host cells is thought of as a really bad thing. But what this is saying is that you get specific complement C3 molecule attached to MHC molecules. And that allows the B cells, 
to grab on to that MHC via a complement receptor. And these marginal zone B cells are the ones that express the specific complement receptor for this modified, in, inactivated version of complement C3. It's complement receptor 2. And it binds to that complement that got attached to the MHC and just yanks it off. Yeah. It, and some other things come with it. it. Exactly. And this is one of the things, again, that was just so surprising to me is that when I think about complement and takeover of complement, I think about complement binding um, very nonspecifically to different biological molecules on the surface of cells. And so the idea that the complement is specifically labeling MHC class 2 um, for MHC class 2 transfer was one of the the things that I read at the beginning and said, no, no way. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I think that 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 to me, the idea that there might be some specificity in that, and we can talk about what the data says about that, um, to me was actually quite fascinating. I would agree with that. And and I think it wasn't just MHC right. class 2. There were a few other things. But it might simply be that there's more MHC class 2 than some of the other proteins on the surface sure. of a dendritic cell once it's activated, right? That one of its main functions is to present antigen, so it's going to upregulate surface expression of MHC. There would be high levels of that. It's not the only molecule, though, on the surface of the dendritic cell. So, yeah, there seems to be some specificity. But, yeah, um, so... Yeah, the idea here is that then those marginal zone B cells that picked up these T these T dependent antigens will then be able to get help from T cells. Now, the one caveat to this that I have is plucking an MHC off of an antigen presenting cell does not guarantee that you have the foreign antigen, right? Do you, and if you get help. Hopefully, it's only going to be from T cells that, you know, are recognizing foreign antigens. But this is going to cause you to produce your antibodies. And h- how, I guess this is, we can come back to this tor- sort of at the end, but how does that B cell know it's supposed to make those antibodies? Because it still doesn't know its own specificity, and it could make autoreactive antibodies, right? Because it's really just plucking off a random MHC molecule and asking a T cell for help, and then making the antibody that it makes. And it's sort of overriding some of the control mechanisms that we typically think are in place in the immune system to prevent you from being able to make an antibody if you don't know it's to something important, speaking from the B cell perspective. Yeah, I I agree with that completely. So the the last thing that we need to introduce is uh, ubiquitination, which I don't think we've talked about. And so lots of proteins get post-translationally modified. So you have an mRNA, you translate it into protein, the protein folds, and then some proteins have their, their function or expression modified by post-translational modifications. So one of the most common ones that we hear about is phosphorylation, right? You can phosphorylate a protein and activate it, inactivate it. But ubiquitination in the immune system, we know this best for being involved in the NF-kappa B activation pathway. And so sometimes if you ubiquinate proteins, in the case of NF-kappa B, it's I-kappa B. When you ubiquitinate it, you target it for degradation. And so that protein is removed. In the case of surface proteins, if they get ubiquitinated, it can sometimes um, cause them to be internalized. And so you remove them from the surface. And so the key protein that they're studying in this is a protein called March 1. And I got to go back to remember exactly what March 1 stands for. It's in the introduction. It is in the introduction. Um, Um, Membrane-associated ring CH type finger 1. (laughs) Thank you. So the ring finger proteins are these ubiquitin ligases. So it is an enzyme that takes ubiquitin protein and sticks it on another protein. And so why is that important? Well, they have these March 1 deficient mice, and that's a lot of what the study has done. Yeah, I I kind of... So we've got complement, we've got MHC, dendritic cells, ubiquitination. Go ahead. Yeah, I I was just going to say, I guess when I got into reading the paper... Um, I looked at it as 
it seemed to me that they had these March 1 deficient mice and mm-hmm. they were working to try to characterize them and they yep. discovered this yep. mechanism that involved all of these other pieces. And so to them, this was originally a story about March 1 that yep. led them to all of the other parts. And I would say, and I don't know this because I don't know these individuals, but the the weird observation that I feel sorry for the postdoc or graduate student who had this, probably came in and said, I have this weird population of cells that has both markers of dendritic cells and markers of B cells. And the PI is going to say, nope, your compensation is wrong. Your antibodies are wrong. There's some sort of cross reactivity. Go back to the drawing board. And so the student goes back and does a bunch of experiments, comes back, says, no, it's still there. And so well, something is wrong. Go back. You can't have this on the same cell. And so a lot of this paper, and we can talk about some of the data, is basically saying, no, it actually really is. <laughs> and there was a crux experiment they did, which you would not have been able to do before you could single cell sort, which will become very important and do single cell sequencing. So um, the first thing that this paper discovered when they were studying their March 1 cells, uh, their March 1 mice. So they made these March 1 knockout mice, this ubiquitination protein, important. And, and they made these mice, and basically somebody had the job of taking all the antibodies that you have in the refrigerator and staining all the different subsets and see if anything's different, right? That's usually what you do when you make a mouse and you're doing immune stuff. And what they found was there is many fewer dendritic cells in the spleen. And so that was the initial observation. And so they started to look at, is it, is it all immune cells or is it just dendritic cells? And it turns out that B cells are normal, T cells are normal, even plasma cytoid dendritic cells are normal. So that's a type of dendritic cell. They were all normal. But the classic dendritic cells or CDCs were reduced. And that was two different subsets. There's this specific thing. They go looking at specific subsets of um, DCs. There's CDC1s and CDC2s, and they have different markers. And there's just fewer of them. And so, well, that's weird. So they also started looking, and <clears throat> that's when they found the – and that's basically what's uh, in the very, the very first figure. Right. They're looking at just dendritic cell numbers – and numbers of other subsets of cells. And really they're, and they do some extra purifications and they deplete and they look and they still see these, these loss of dendritic cells. And I got stuck on it a while because I'm like, what does that really have to do with all the rest of this? Because in the whole rest, like the majority of the rest of the paper is really talking about these marginal zone B cells. So the catch is as they were doing these analyses, they saw, which, which was the, the major finding and which is the thing that we're going to talk about, is that they had these population of dendritic cells that expressed both markers from dendritic cells, or these, these weird cells, not dendritic cells, the weird markers that had both den- markers of dendritic cells and markers of B cells, specifically marginal zone B cells, because they did a whole bunch of gating and looking, and they look at marginal zone B cell markers and they could see these dendritic cell markers. Yeah. And and they and that those are uh, exactly the the plots I think that Cindy was talking about with the you can imagine the graduate student or postdoc um, coming up with the plot in figure two A, um, where yep. there's just all of a sudden this cell population, 22.3% of the cells in this figure. A lot. Which is a it's a substantial population of cells that sh- are weird and shouldn't be there and shouldn't be there. It's sort of and aren't question really of- there in wild type cells, right? right. So, so the, I it, mean, they are there but only if you specifically looked for them, right? If they go back right. now and look in wild type, they can see them. But no one would have ever, I mean, if you look at the paper, no one would have ever drawn a gate and said, "Oh, look at that couple of dots there in the wild type mice." But they only saw it because of they were using these March 1 knockout mice. Okay, that's what I wanted to ask you. The March 1 made them come jump out, right? Yes. Yep. Got it. Yep. Okay. So 
the, there's a lot of data and a lot of complicated experiments that go that follow this up. But basically, the conclusion from that first part is this suggested that, and I'm reading from the paper, CD11C intermediate, that's a dendritic cell marker, CD24 positive, CD8 intermediate cells were B cells that displayed CDC markers, but did not, uh, okay, so yeah. So, so the big thing is now is, are they uh, uh, in between population that has B cell markers and T cell markers, or is it a dendritic cell that has upregulated B cell markers, or a B cell that has upregulated dendritic cell markers, or is it something else going on? And so what they were able to do is sort the specific populations and look at the transcriptome. Now, why is that important? Because you look at surface markers and that's proteins. And presumably, the way biology works, until, except for this, generally, <laughs> is you transcribe your genes, you make our mRNA, and then that mRNA makes protein. But all of us have done experiments where it's not always exactly that because there's some mRNA regulation that can happen and there's some post-translational regulation that can happen and, and there's not always a one-to-one -one correlation with genes and proteins, but it's generally pretty true. But what they saw time and again, and purification and various different things that they did was every time they pulled out this weird population, it was entirely B cells. The transcriptome looked like B cells. There wasn't even the markers that were being detected on the surface in the transcriptome. So how the heck can that happen? Yeah, I think the the... I really liked the way that they did these experiments where they showed this both by proteins on the surface, um, told you that these seem to be B cells, and transcriptome tells you that these seem to be B cells. Um, I thought that was really nice. And I thought that the experiment where they looked at the um, DC markers and showed that these weird cells have conventional dendritic cell markers, but they have a lower level of them. They don't yep. have as many as a, a dendritic cell would have. They they have them a little bit less. Um, I think is important to think of, and thinking about this model. Um, That's right. And I just the one sort of other caveat that I've been thinking about the entire way <laughs> reading this paper is that they do show here that their B cells do have some MHC on their surface, yep. um, and they will get to later thinking about what's going on with the B cells' own MHC versus um, MHC that they uh, might steal by trogocytosis. And they do nicely show that the B cells do have their own MHC here. Um, so I didn't feel... Which we would expect. Yes, which we would expect. Because they can be antigen presenting Yeah, I, I, I guess my thought was that um, I didn't have to rewrite everything in my head about certain parts <laughs> of immunology. It was good to see that... <laughs> Your first, first reaction is always, oh God, how do I have to change my immunology lectures? Yeah. <laughs> So, so the cells yeah, do no, have I their own know. MHC plus two, um, we, even without this. Um, and we can all see that they have sort of acquired a small amount of their DC markers. That they don't seem to be acquiring through transcription yes. of their own genome. Right. So that that that's the weird thing, right? What I do think is nice is um, when you find something weird like this, you have to do a lot of control experiments, and the control, the, all the controls that they run are just so nice mm -hmm. to help you understand what's going on and really do support their data. For example, they're looking at different markers on that are characteristic of. CDCs in general, or CDC1s, or CDC2s, or B cells, or other cells, and they look at the expression levels on all of them, like you said, and they very clearly see their populations are expressing what they're supposed to be expressing, not expressing what they're not supposed to be expressing, except for this one unique population, right? And the transcriptomes, the DCs match the DCs, the B cells match the B cells, and these weird cells look exactly like B cells. Right. And, and that's important because they're largely finding these weird cells in the March 1 deficient mice. And so right. you could say, well, maybe March 1 just totally messes up B cells or totally messes up DCs. And no, the March 1 deficient mice have B cells that look like B cells. They have yep. dendritic cells that look like dendritic cells. It's just this other weird population um, that they have as yep. well. 
And and that's important when they do the the cluster analysis. So if you look at the whole genome expression, the wild type B cells and the March 1 B cells cluster together. Right. So that just tells you that the B cells are normal in those mice, but those weird cells are more like a B cell, right? Um, and so they have their transcription like just like a marginal zone B cell. And they, they I, I must admit these zebra things or whatever it's called in D, where they looking at overall gene expression patterns. I'm, I, I got a little bit off, but I mean, basically what I think it's saying is like the dendritic cells don't express genes characteristic of B cell receptor signaling pathway and B cell activation, whereas B cells do and these weird population that they find in the March 1 cells look like B cells and have transcriptional profiles that are very similar to B cells. That was my understanding too. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Um, and then um, they they looked at specific genes. And again, I thought this was really nice. Like if you look for, for genes that should only be in, in dendritic cells, like you pick out specific genes, they show very clearly with a million, you know, uh, numbers per million reads, that they are really truly only expressed in the CDCs and not in the B cells and not in this weird population. So, I, and, they, and they show a bunch of different things and they do even some more um, flow cytometry and they really narrow down to this marginal zone B cell. But the bottom line from all of this and all of these control studies is really to say that these are truly marginal zone B cells, but they have dendritic cell markers on their surface that they that didn't get there by them transcribing them. Yeah. So then they are scratching their heads because how the heck else do you get um, yeah, markers it, no, exactly. on your surface so, if you didn't make them yourself? Right. So <laughs> speaking to the point you made earlier, Cindy, about kind of how this is regulated and how these B cells know to do all of the stuff that's going on in this paper, um, I think that it's really nice that they have this figure uh where they are showing that these are specifically marginal zone B cells and doing a lot of gating. Yep. It looks like they do yep. get some of the weird cells that are not marginal zone cells. Um, and yep. so, you know, I am not a uh, B cell efficient or expert to know no, how we could distinguish B cells and exactly maybe if this is a special type of marginal zone cell or something like that, that might be something for them to figure out in the future. Oh, they're probably going to name it something and call it some subset of marginal zone B cells that do this. The, yeah, the, like the thief cells that, or that's something. What, <laughs> that's what people do. Oh, that's <laughs> a great name. Okay, we have to put that in the title, the the thieves. Anyway, uh, yeah. So these these investigators now, imagine, you know, you're sitting in your the office and you're discussing this research and you're like, okay, so they definitely pulled these surface proteins from somewhere, how did they get them? And how do we figure out how they got them? So I guess, you know, the easiest thing to do and what they did was just start culturing B cells and dendritic cells together and see, can they, can they transfer antigens? And they do it in a really nice way. And there's a whole bunch of controls that you can look at in the supplementary data. But basically, they're going to label the surface of the dendritic cell and then incubate it with a B cell. So the dendritic cells labels fluorescently. They're going to incubate it with a B cell. And then they're just going to look at the B cells and see if they have fluorescence. Because if they have fluorescence, they picked it up from the dendritic cells. And that's what they see. And it's really much more in the uh, March 1 B cells than in total B cells. Um, and then they start looking at, you know, is it dependent? Is March 1, does it need to be on the dendritic cell or does it need to be on the B cell? And so these where the experiments start to get really, really complicated. But the bottom line here is that if you incubate B cells with dendritic cells, they can pick up the antigens from the dendritic cells and they do it much better if the dendritic cells are March 1 deficient. So there's something about March 1, that enhances the transfer of these antigens. Well, because if you think back to where we started, it's dangerous to do this. So you want to do it in a controlled way. So there must be some way to control this. Well, well isn't it that the absence of March 1 oh, enhances sorry. Yeah, 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 doing that, this? 
apps I, I, in the March one knockout. Yeah. I said that backwards. In the March one knockouts, it's enhanced. Yeah. So there's something about lacking March one, which we know from what we're talking about before is a ubiquitin ligase and it usually downregulates things. So it's probably having something to do with MHC expression on the surface, right? So if you lack March 1, somehow there's more MHC. So we'll come back to that. But basically, if you lack March 1, there's much better transfer to the B cells. So um, do they actually use marginal zone B cells in these in vitro experiments? Or just B cells? I don't think they purify the marginal zone B cells. Yeah, I, right. so um, they're I, just, they do in I think um, they, part they do of the in experiment. Some experiments. Um, so I think let's see where it the, is. The last part they do. Yeah, in the last the part C. they do um, yeah. and see that it is, this is happening even more when they purify marginal zone B cells. Um, but for All most right, so. of the experiments, they use just um, total B cells from the spleen. Um, they are often here looking at spleen and every so often they'll look at, say, lymph node or B cells from somewhere other than the spleen. Um, and marginal zone B cells only live in the spleen. And so Correct. in a few places, they show <laughs> that this is unique to splenic B cells um, right? and are sort of inferring that that might be marginal zone. And how, how efficient is this? So does every B cell do this if no. it's put in or just a fraction? So if you look at um, the, the, it's figure 3B, if yep. you're following along. Yep. I see so it here, yep. if you incubate B cells with dendritic cells, if it's just a wild type dendritic cell, so not March one, it, it's about um, six, four, six to ten percent of the cells pick up antigens, okay. and it's not just MHC class two that they pick up. They do pick up CD eight, they pick up CD eleven C, and they pick up CD eleven B and XCR one. Um, but if you lack March one those B cells pick up a lot more. So it goes up to in as high as 25% um, will be expressing those markers. Yeah. And they do fabulous controls here as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just so clear. If you don't have any dendritic cells, there's, of course, no antigens. And then there's a whole bunch of other um, it, controls that they do um, from labeling, and, and they make sure that both... One one easy explanation, let me put it this way. One easy explanation is if you your March 1 deficient cells label much better, then you would get more label transfer. But that's not true. They label and they label equally well. So they do like all of these controls to confirm that the labeling is the same, the incubation is the same, and really the markers are coming from the dendritic cells onto the B yeah, cells. They, so if you, they, let's say you put a non-immune cell mm -hmm. into this, not a B cell, something else, would they also pick up? Or? So I was, I was just So they didn't do this experiment, but trogocytosis was, I, I, if I'm racking my brain correctly, was originally identified between uh, like professional antigen presenting cells like a dendritic cell and a T cell. And so when those interacted, sometimes you could find the MHC class two on a T cell. And T cells don't express MHC class two, right? So MHC class two is really restricted to antigen presenting cells, restricted in quotations, but yeah. generally, yes. So all, all cells in quotes express MHC class one, but they could see some MHC class two on T cells. And it was only after they had an interaction with the antigen presenting cell. Yeah, so the one thing they do show is they show, um, they put B cells with other types of cells besides conventional yeah. dendritic cells. And they show macrophages, that, that B cells do -cells. not acquire membrane from macrophages or T cells or things like that. The B cells are only acquiring from the conventional dendritic cells. And it's predominantly the marginal zone B cells and not follicular B cells or any other subtypes of B cells that they find. And so they do that by purifying those out in the subpopulations and then incubating them and looking at their uptake of these antigens. So these B cells have dendritic cell antigens on their surface. They didn't come from transcription by the B cell itself. If you incubate a B cell with a dendritic cell, Predominantly, if they are lacking March 1, they can pick up these antigens just in vitro. So those are the, the, first, the main findings from the first couple of figures. 
Yeah. Did I miss anything or is there anything you want to add on to that? No, I think that that makes sense. Um, I think that, and it's a good to say that now because it feels, again, felt to me um, with the next figure, like they shifted gears a little bit um, and then it, which eventually came back together. Um, but I felt like figure four, again, was, hey, look at this other weird thing we found in March 1 deficient cells. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, it was, it's three weird things, right? Yeah. First is that they have fewer dendritic cells. And they're like, well, why would that be? And we still haven't come back to that. We'll come back to that. Then they found this weird population that seems to be pulling things off dendritic cells, which We'll come back to why that's important for the fewer dendritic cells. And now, now all of a sudden they're going to switch gears again and they say, guess what? We see lots of CD3 on the surface of March 1 deficient dendritic cells. Yeah. And, and C3 is interesting because it's one of the, it's that complement protein that um, that's right. is made via the tick over process um, that can right. sometimes label um, host cells. And so it seems as though the March 1 deficient um, dendritic cells or sorry, yeah, the March 1 deficient dendritic cells yep. um, have much more C3 deposited on their surface than do dendritic cells from um, wild type. Um, and again, they do the nice controls here. But there is some. Yeah. So they do detect it. The other thing that's important to know, <clears throat> and I mentioned it briefly, is that C3 is not necessarily C3, 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 right? So when we talk about activating the complement system, everything converges on C3, and that's like the major thing that's going on. And we know C3 gets deposited, let's say, on the first surface of bacteria for two main purposes. The first purpose is to get, uh, it's called opsonization, right? So it coats the, the bacteria so that, for example, a macrophage can recognize and it doesn't need to know what the bug is or that it's a bug. It could just see the tag and eat the thing with the tag on it. So it eats anything expressing C3 on the surface. The second thing is it can recruit the membrane attack complex to lyse those bacteria directly. But if you get C3 on your host cells, there's one other thing that can happen, and it's really nicely um, shown in the supplementary data in their first figure, and they show you how all these complement components come together and activation and activation. But, but the, what happens is the C3 gets inactivated. And so it, can't, it can no longer recruit like the membrane attack complex, but it can still be recognized by complement receptor 2. Yeah, and so it's sort of like and some additional modifications on C3. Um, they will later talk about C3D and C3DG, and those are that right. those modified versions of C3. That's right. So, so they just take their March 1 cells, and I really have no idea why they did this, but their March 1 knockouts, <laughs> and they stain for C, C, C3. This is probably this graduate student comes in. Guess what? This, this C3, there's, <laughs> there's more staining of C3 on the surface of this. Why did you steam for C3? Anyway, so we'll probably get lots of people say, we know the story and you guys are crazy. But yeah, I mean, they, they, have, they did this experiment. They have like one sentence transition to this that make it sound like, Correct. of course we knew we should look for C3. Um, but they didn't know. They didn't know. Anyway, so somebody somebody pulled an antibody out of the freezer and they steamed for C3. But anyway, there's really high expression of C3 if you lack March 1. Now, an important control for this is you would say, are you sure that's C3? Because are you sure you're antibody specific? And so they do it in a C3 knockout and there's no staining. So it, it is C3 for whatever reason. Um, and so they start looking at, well, do all cells have C3 or is there something unique? And, and what's going on? Is it, is it March 1 dependent or do lots of cells have C3? Because we don't really expect lots of cells to have C3 because there's complement regulatory proteins that pluck C3 off or degrade it or whatever. And so host cells should not generally have a lot of C3 on them. So they look in the spleen, they look in the lymph node, they look in the thymus, they look at conventional dendritic cells, plasmacyte dendritic cells, T cells, B cells, macrophages, neo neutrophils, eosinophils, da 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 Basically, if you lack March 1, all of a sudden you start seeing staining on various different cells, although much more... Um, pronounced if you look at dendritic cells, um, CDC1 and CDC2, not necessarily plasma cytodendritic cells. And there is some on the different subsets, but it's way less than you see on these two. So something is happening that is allowing much more C3 binding to the surface of uh, March 1 deficient cells, and it happens much more on these dendritic cells than on any other cell type. 
So what they start asking next is, who needs to express the C3? Yeah, are the cells themselves, are those dendritic cells themselves making C3 and throwing it on their surface? Or are they capturing it from uh, C3 that is made from somebody else, from some other cell? Right. So where, what's, do you know the major source of complement proteins in the body? I do. Uh, it's the liver. <laughs> That's right. So if the liver is the main source of the complement proteins, they did a clever experiment, which is commonly done in immunology, where you wait, make what's called a bone marrow chimera. So you take a C3 deficient mouse and you irradiate it to get rid of all of its hematopoietic cells. And then you can give it back and replenish its immune system with whatever you want. So you can put back wild type cells or you can put back cells that lack March 1 or you can get super clever and put back both but have them tagged so you can see them separately. Yeah, which is kind of interesting, so, right? So the idea is basically that the immune system has one genotype and the rest of the body has another genotype. Or in this case, right. the immune cells have two different genotypes and you can distinguish if the cells with those genotypes are acting differently in whatever body environment they are in. Right. So we're taking wild type bone marrow cells and March 1 knockout bone marrow cells. We mix them together and we can separate them by flow cytometry because they have different markers. And we're going to take both of those and put them into a mouse that either has complement C3 or does not have complement C3. And so the question is, who needs to express March 1 or lack March 1? And who needs to have, a, do you need C3 or not? The bottom line of this experiment, and we could go through each data point, but basically you have to have C3. So the environment has to have C3 because the liver has to be making C3. So the mouse itself has to have complement. And the dendritic cells have to have a deficiency in March 1. So you can pull them apart and only the March 1 deficient cells get labeled. And they only get labeled with C3 if there's C3 there. So you need both. Did I explain that correctly? Yes. Leanne? And, and um, you looked a little confused. I think that it, <laughs> so I think that it... You know, I think about it first as they also are showing that the C3 is probably coming from the liver and not from the dendritic cells themselves. And I'm not sure that I expected right. that it was coming from the dendritic cells itself. I, I would not have expected that. I suppose that they can make a little bit, but the main source is going to yeah, be the but liver. So, so basically they're showing that um, it, you have to have a the recipient, the rest of the body has to be able to make C3. If they just put in... Um, wild type cells that can make C3, but the rest of the body doesn't make it. It doesn't work. Um, and the cells that are going to pick up that C3 are predominantly the March 1 deficient CDCs. Right. So that's that's in the whole animal. And this is all C3, right? So <laughs> we're, we're not looking at the trogocytosis stuff here. We're just saying that cells can be labeled with C3. Now, what... What they connect next is w trying to pull these two things together, right? Yeah. So, like, so what, what is C three attached to on the surface right. of the cells? Is it just randomly everywhere on the cells? Is it specifically attached to something? Where is this C three? Right. So, what they find is that the C three is on a couple of different things, but predominantly the um, MHC class two. Yeah. And they do that because they can do cool tricks like make a mouse that doesn't have any MHC class two. And now you look at the surface of a dendritic cell and they really no longer label with the C3. Yeah. I, I found or, all of, oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Go, I was go, go. Say, I, I, I was really, I really liked this um, because this is one of the things that I wanted to see as I was reading through the paper was I definitely wanted to see some controls um, with class two deficient cells um, to under, when I was reading about the model at the beginning. So I really liked how they started with just looking at the CDCs and looking to see if they had um, C3 on their surface. 
and finding that yep. they did have C3 on their surface, but it was a weird form of C3. So it, Correct. it was, and they did a whole, they had a whole bunch of different antibodies and they show this in the supplementary data. There's many, many different antibodies that can recognize C3 and they will recognize different forms of C3. Right. And they kind of came up with the idea of this weird band that is uh, 70 kilodaltons. Um, it looks like oh, yeah. it's on the Western blood. It looks like it's C3 bound to class two. Correct. Um, and so they say, well, wait, maybe C3 is bound to class two here. Um, and so they do see other sized products, um, but there is this predominant product um, that they're seeing in these cells. And that product is not present in the serum. Um, and they also nicely show that if they have um, a lack of March 1, they have much more C3 on the surface. More of it. Mm -hmm. um, and yep. if they use a ver if they have no MHC on the cells, there's no C3 on the surface. Right. And if they use a version of MHC um, that can't be internalized by March 2, right. we've got C3 all over the surface. So this starts yep. to pull together March 2 internalization right. and C3 bound to class 2 on the surface. Right. So the other thing that this group knew that you just you just said is that this March three protein or March one protein, its main job we talked about it, is it's a ubiquitin ligase. So it ligates ubiquitins. Well, they already knew that MHC class two has this ubiquitin site, and that March one can ubiquitinate that site, and that that's important for internalizing MHC class two. So you're right. They took a a cell that had MHC class 2, except that it had just a mutation in the ubiquitin. And that'll, that'll become important again, too. And so it can't be ubiquitinated, so it, it doesn't get internalized well. And because it doesn't get internalized well, it can now be uh, connected to complement, can now be I fixed with complement. I was get confused with the way you want to say that. Oh, see, it's, it's interesting because I kind of think of it as a slightly different way that it's oh. not that. So you were saying because the MHC can't get internalized, complement can't attach. Uh, as I think, what, how oh, you, oh, how you oh, phrased oh, it. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It can't be internalized. I I said it wrong. It's it stays on the surface. Yeah, I was gonna say it. it and because it, it can't, can't get internalized, throw it away. Stays on the surface. And then the co complement accumulates. Yeah, so I was so basically what's the happening MHC is still on the surface, and right. sorry, it, it gets complement on it at some rate, and you can't get rid of that because you can't right. internalize. So the normal function is that complement will attach to proteins randomly. Probably there's just a lot of MHC on the surface, so it gets attached, and probably it has some sort of affinity for it. Somehow the it, there's a chemical beneficial. Yeah. You know, potential that that's a better substrate. So it gets attached, and that's not a good thing. You don't really want that to happen. So there's a protection mechanism. The protection mechanism is dependent on March 1, and that March 1 protein will ubiquitinate the cytoplasmic tail and cause internalization of that MHC. So now if you have that ubiquitin mutated or you have March 1, loss, now you have accumulation of MHC class 2 on the surface that doesn't get internalized when it gets C3 attached to it. Did I summarize that properly? Now? Yes. Okay. So an so, important function of March 1 is to pull do this in, with mm -hmm. MHC, right? To yes. pull it down so that yep. you, to internalize it to recycle MHCs yeah, basically. Okay. So, um, one of the things that they did also was look at co-immunoprecipitations. So, complement, when it fixes onto a protein, it's a covalent attachment and you can't pull it back off, right? It's not like it's a, um, a sulfur, you know, a disulfide bond that you can break apart. It's, it's, it's fixed. And the 70 kilodalton protein, they predicted that was this association of the C3 uh, mutant version with, uh, or the inactivated version with MHC class 2. So the way you can do this is you can look at a whole bunch of different types of cells and you can pull down MHC class 2 and you can look for MHC class 2. 
And what they showed was, uh, or you can blot for C3 and see if it's there. And, and bottom line is, if you pull down MHC class 2 and you blot for C3, you pull down C3 and you blot for MHC class 2, you can see them. And it's the same molecular weight band. And they even went on to cut out that band and demonstrate by um, mass spectrometry that it had both MHC and complement in the band. And then they did all the controls where if you don't have MHC or you have a mutant MHC or you don't have complement or, or, you know, don't have March 1. And basically they showed that this C3 accumulates on MHC in the absence of March 1 and it depends on complement and um, it's enhanced also if you lack that um, ubiquitination site so you can't get internalized. So first of all, the we're just kind of seeing, okay, so... We, we're seeing one cool thing of Mar about that March 1 is doing. March 1 is trying to get this complement labeled MHC class 2 off the surface. Um, and they do a little bit as well with glycosylation. And they kind of yep. think that complement may be targeting class 2 because of its glycosylations. Right. Because if they deglycosylate it, they lose the, the complement attachment which would suggest that it was attached to a glycosylation. Okay. So we, we definitely have complement attaching to MHC on these CDCs. So what they want to do uh, next, actually, all of this was done in mouse. So they want to know, is this really happening in human so they they look at donors, and it's it's not quite as impressive, but it works. Um, and they definitely see um, labeling of C three on uh, dendritic cells. And just keep in mind that these these are not so they're one they're circulating dendritic cells. They're not in mm -hmm. spleen, and they're normal dendritic cells. They're not lacking March 1, but they can still see some C3, although it's low, but they can see some C3. And they show that this is specific because they do have patients that lack MHC class 2, and they don't see the C3 as much on the surface. It's a little lower. So this experiment has a whole lot of caveats because the whole thing was identified in March 1 deficient cells because that enhances the MHC on the surface. But they could see some complement labeling of healthy dendritic cells that are circulating, not in the spleen because we did not take spleens from people <laughs> and crush them up. So, um, yeah. So they did, the, I guess... It's, it's weak, but it's there. And uh, the argument is that's the only way you can really do it in humans. And they were able to see a little bit. Right. And that was enough. Right. And, and I kind of wonder, um, you know, it, it's, it's a small amount that you're seeing, but has anyone ever looked before for C3 on dendritic cells? I, I don't know that I would have before this thought to look. Um, and so, you know, hey, we looked and you do see it. Um, it, it is sort of some nice relevance. Yeah. So I guess the, you might be wondering the next question. So that was just kind of a side thing, just so it, so it happens in human. But you might be wondering, if we have complement now labeling MHC, and we had this thing where B cells, specifically marginalosome B cells, B cells were good at that, were pulling, plucking things off the dendritic cell membranes. The question is, does any of this have anything, any, any relevance to each other, right? So we know that marginal zone B cells can express complement receptors, specifically complement receptor 2, that will recognize the C3. And now we have dendritic cells that we know can give away their MHC and that we know that MHC can be attached to complement. So the question then becomes, are these connected and it, can, you, can you show that there's actual transfer and by what mechanism? And so the whole next series of experiments were basically designed to that allow you to make the conclusion that the B cells have to express 
complement receptor 2. And the dendritic cells have to express MHC. And you have to have complement. And you have to have ubiquitination of the MHC by March 1. And so all of that is going to lead to the B cells to pluck off the MHCs. Yeah. It, lack of lack of ubiquitination by March 1, loss of March 1. You now have MHC that's stabilized on the surface. It gets labeled with C3, and then the B cells reach over with their complement receptor and pluck off that MHC that's labeled with C3. Yeah, and they do this first in cells in culture, and then they do Correct. the um, bone marrow chimera experiments to show yep. some of this transfer happening um, in actual mice as well. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I think. <laughs> you know, and, and again, so you can say, oh my goodness, the, this idea that membrane is transferred might seem a little like crazy. And, oh, complements labeling MHC. Oh my gosh. The, you know, these are, these are impressive things that I would not have necessarily expected. Um, but they can actually demonstrate this phenomenon happening in mice. Um, and that's just And they cool. do the co a whole bunch of different things because that's that makes bone marrow chimera means you can control who's expressing what. And then you can start seeing what's important and what's required, which which is really, really cool. Do the B cells always produce a complement receptor? The marginal the marginal zone, zone B cells. Yeah, yeah, they do. As far as I know. I'm I I'm sure there are regulatory mechanisms that up or down regulate or whatever, yeah, yeah. but it um, if you pull out the B cells from the spleen and you look for who's expressing CR2, this could predominantly be the marginal zone B cells. Yes, and could I say that there are no marginal zone B cells that don't have it? Nope, but because I definitely don't nope, know that kind neither. of stuff about B cells. I have no idea. Um, so there could be, so it could be just a subset of marginal zone B cells that have CR2, um, but there certainly is a group who have CR2. So is, is trogocytosis in other conditions also mediated by a, a receptor ligand interaction, you think, like this? Well, in, in the T cell receptor APC, it's li it, it, as, as far as I understand, it's a T cell receptor binding to MHC peptide complex. I see. And that's strong enough to... to okay. uh, well, I should say... That's part of a, a super molecular complex of proteins that tightly bind the T cell to the MHC. And so I guess if you try and pull apart, you can pull that off. It's not just one protein-protein interaction. But this is presumably one protein-protein interaction between complement that's attached to MHC and complement receptor on the B cell. So there must there must be something about marginal zone B cells and their ability to rearrange the cytoskeleton in a way to create the energy to pull that or to bleb off. That I guess I'm I, I'm raising a question as I say that that I didn't think about, and that is you could think of it as the B cell pulling or the T, or the APC donating. Yeah. So the, yeah. the APC <laughs> could actually bleb off, right, and deliver little packets to the B cell that could t take it up. Right. They did not do an experiment to ask whether there's direct contact required. Right. They did a co-incubation, but they threw them both in a dish and they could touch each other, or they could pick up something that they've secreted, right? And lots of cells secrete little extracellular vesicles. And vesicle they can release MHCs. Um, definitely another way to get rid of proteins that could cause a problem is to bleb them off and spit them off. So some cells do that. Right. So you can pull it in or you can spit it out. And so it's not clear from this whether they might be blebbing off. Yeah. I, I mean, so there, oh, go ahead. There, in the presence of March 1, right, there must still be enough MHC on the surface of the APC to allow this to happen at some level, right? Or is March 1 regulated to control that? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, yeah. Could be. I, right? I think that both of the questions that you, you all are asking um, are really great questions that make the assumption 
that this whole process has a function to it. God. Um, uh, exactly. And, and so yeah. at this point, we haven't shown in the paper that this has any kind of functional consequence. Sure. It just could yep. be right. kind of a cool thing that happens. And so until <laughs> you show that there's a functional consequence, I think that at least if it were me, I would hold off on doing some of those experiments. Um, like, is the B cell pushing or or is the B cell pulling or yeah. the DC pulling? Yeah. Or how are we regulating March 1 until we see the functional consequence and know that yeah, this sure. actually matters? Happily, and that's, there's another that's figure. Probably, right, yeah, exactly. This is when you're sitting in your office going, cool, but so what? Yep. Right. We could publish that, and there's definitely enough data to say this happens. But wouldn't it be cool if we could show it actually does something? And if it did, that would be a much better paper and much more interesting and exciting. So, what do the dendritic cells do that the marginal B cells don't do? They activate activate T cells. T -cells. Remember, that was By way this, back at the beginning right. that it way looked back. like the way marginal back. zone B cells were getting T cell help, but it wasn't clear how they could have MHC on their surface to allow them to get T cell help. Right. So one might say, well, how are we going to test that? Well, you got to see if you can have marginal zone B cells that are not able to activate T cells, then incubate them with the dendritic cell and see if now they're all of a sudden able to activate a T-cell. And so that's basically what they do. There's a whole bunch of other experiments in here, but they get really clever in how they do this. And they take the an antibody that will bind to the surface of the dendritic cell, and they give it antigen that way. So th that's really the only cell that's taking up the antigen, and they have a whole bunch of controls in there to make sure that that's actually really true and that the B cells aren't taking up the antigen what that they're delivering that way. But basically they're immunizing in a mouse with an antibody that's fused to an antigen. So they're specifically targeting antigen presentation to the CDCs. And then they can ask, do the marginal zone B cells present the antigen? And they can ask this because they have a, an antibody that will only detect, uh, that will detect the peptide MHC complex. So they delivered with a specific antigen. Um, they can detect that peptide MHC, and they see that on B cells. And uh, am, I, am I getting that right? Yeah. So the, the antibody is, is YAE, and it will recognize this peptide in the context of MHC. And so you can see it on the CDCs. But you can also see it on the marginal zone B cells, which could not take up the antigen. So they couldn't have gotten, they couldn't have been able to make the peptide and the MHC peptide complex on their own. But you can actually see them uh, staining for this particular peptide MHC complex. And really, they're showing it only, they, they don't do it with March 1 deficient, but they do it with the MHC that lacks the ubiquitination. So then they can see that on, on the B cells. And that depends on complement. So it depends on lack of internalization of the MHC by the dendritic cell, and it depends on complement. So the model is that the, when the MHC is stabilized on the surface of the dendritic cell, then it gets complement attached, and then the B cell can come over and pull it off. And now you can see that specific peptide MHC complex on the B cell. So it's not just any MHC. You can actually feed the dendritic cells one, AME, one peptide or you know, antigen, and you can actually see that come up on the B cells. And the B cells are unable to present that any other way. Yeah, and, and they can really only start to detect this well on the marginal zone B cells when they have that yep. MHC that's stuck on the surface. That's the only time right. where they're getting this at a level that they're actually detecting that transferred uh, MHC plus peptide. And now I interpreted that as it, that was because it was affecting the expression level on the CDCs. Right. Yeah. Because so, this is in a mouse. Yeah. I was, I was saying okay. that it's, it's, you're not internalizing it off the CDC. It's staying on the CDC yes, surface right. longer. Correct. And so is much more likely to get transferred because it isn't thrown in the trash via some other mechanism. Yep. And so, again, really cool. You can prove 
that you can get peptide MHC transferred from a CDC to a B cell. But the, the, the question is, is does it actually do anything? <laughs> mm-hmm. Who cares? Yeah. So fortunately, immunologists have lots of cool tools. <laughs> and so they have clonal T cells that are specific for that particular peptide MHC complex. And they can, you can label the T cells and then you can look at them proliferate. So T cell proliferation is a really great marker of their activation status. So if they interact with an APC and they, you know, they recognize a peptide MHC and they get all the signals, they proliferate really well. And you can measure this proliferation because you can label the starting population. And every time the cells double, they divide the dye equally between the two daughter cells. And so you can look at uh, half by half by half staining and that will tell you exactly how many proliferative rounds these T cells have gone through because they'll have half and a quarter and an eighth and anyway down the line. And so basically the marginal zone B cells from uh, uh, that are interacting with the dendritic cells that have the mutation, so they can't be ubiquitinated, so they're stuck on the surface and we know they get complement labeled, they the, then you incubate them, the, then you pull the B cells out and you incubate with them with specific T cells. Now those specific T cells proliferate. So this is telling you this is a functional interaction. So the, the B cells got the a, uh, peptide MHC from the antigen presenting cells, and then they were able to show that to a T cell and cause that T cell to be activated. So this is actually a functional interaction. And this depended on the stabilization of the MHC at the surface of the CDC, and it required complement. Yeah, and and if I'm going to be, um, not, I'm not saying that if I'm going to be generous in quite the way, like I don't, I believe this. But what you can note is that in the situation where there's no complement, there is a little bit less than in wild type. There is. Right. And so, you know, because you might say, well, okay, so in this artificial system, we see this situation, but does it actually happen in wild type? And yeah, there's a little bit less if you don't have complement compared to what you saw in wild type. So it does look like this is really happening in um, the wild type situation. And I hadn't thought about that, that, but that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Because you also have to think about is, is this a really cool phenomenon that only happens when you have mutant receptors expressed in in only unique populations and is some weird thing that does happen, but is absolutely meaningless for life, right? Yeah. But what you're saying and the fact that they could see the complement labeling MHC, albeit at a low level in human peripheral Mm-hmm. DCs yes. suggest that this does this may actually be functional. Yeah. I, now they haven't done an experiment to show that it really does play an important role in some sort of in the, disease yeah, or, or protection in the B cell. or whatever. Right. We don't see the B right. cell getting happen. a new function. <laughs> um, right. But it can happen. Yeah. So when I when I read this, one of the things I was worried about, you know, at the beginning of the paper was, but what about the MHC on the B cell? The B cell has its own right. MHC, and so right. I think yep. it's really important that they can show there is some effect for this transfer in the wild type situation um, and that this MHC is doing something potentially above what the B cell's own MHC is doing. Yep. How could you show that this matters in some disease situation, as you say? Can you specifically knock it out in some way? Oh, I, I'm sure I could rack my brain to do an experiment. There's probably a way to <laughs> temporally and in a drug-driven way express a certain something in cells yeah. and then... In, yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess you could also look whatever. at different disease phenotypes in the March 1 deficient mice yeah. where yeah. the frequency of this is changing. But I would then, in that case, I would make a dendritic cell-specific deficient March 1 because I don't know what other roles that might play in any other cell types. Right. I don't. I don't have any idea. Well, if you if you make it deficient in March one, then you're going to have more MHC on the surface, so you're going to have more of this, right? Right. But you want to go the other way, where you have 
none none of it but you can't have no mhc on the surface of an of an apc that's no good right so hey, I, don't, um, I mean you're right there must be a way to interfere with this but then when you look at it it may not even be a, a, an infection it may be just during development that this is important right. right who knows so something i could think of really quickly is if you immunize with dendritic cells that are expressing a specific antigen like let's say a tumor antigen that you could then, well, that might not be the best. You you would want one that you have, that you need antibodies for protection or disease, right? And then you'd want maybe to have a, a B cell, marginal zone B cell expressing a particular antibody so that if they get activated, they make an antibody and so you know it's driven by that process. I don't know. Yeah, the, the thing that I was thinking about, um, sort of the experiment or the, the question that I was thinking that I couldn't really answer, at least not easily, was that they show that these marginal zone B cells can activate T cells by showing that they can make the T cells proliferate, but they don't actually show that this leads to any benefit to the B cell, that the, act, that the B cell gets B cell help, but at the same time- And that's where we started, right? Right. But at the same time, how are you going to fish out that B cell that has undergone this rare process and see- what's different about it compared to the, another B cell. I'm not sure how one would do that experiment, um, but that is where we started. At the same time, I'm, if you told me about this paper before I looked at it, there were a lot of things in here I'm not sure I, believe, I would have believed that you could have done in the first place. So maybe they can do it <laughs> um, in their subsequent paper. <laughs> Well, I would think that if you incubate those B cells with the T cells and you see T cell proliferation, there's got to be a B cell output that you could also measure. I mean, maybe that's just antibodies. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if it's enough, if those T cells provide enough help. Right. Well, and it, would there be a way to compare the B cell that got help and the B cell that didn't get help? to see if they are different. I don't know how you could actually identify the helped versus unhelped B cell. Well, well, you're incubating the marginal zone B cells in the wild type condition with T cells, but you're not really able to give them help, but they, if they, so that's without okay. help, right? Yeah. Not entirely though, because you just said that the wild types cause a little proliferation. Um, if the B cells are MHC class 2 deficient, so they can't do anything on their own unless they pick up the MHC from the dendritic cell, right. then you could incubate them with the T cells. So if they didn't pick up at the peptide MHC or they did pick up the peptide MHC, then you incubate them with the T cells and then you could look at whether those B cells are doing anything. Well, I think you could... I think you could do that, but I also think that they have done a tremendous amount of work and some beautiful <laughs> controls and quite a lot here. So I think this is enough for I one paper. That could be their I would next have been reviewer three. <laughs> <laughs> Show me the B cells do something too. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that can be their it's next so, paper. It's only like a 45 panel, eight figure with how many supplementary data figures? It was like seven or something like that. <laughs> But anyway, so coming back to the beginning, we also they they also observed that there were fewer CDCs in the March one deficient animals in the spleen, and so they come back to make the argument that the reason why that is 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 because those dendritic cells expressed a lot of MHC because they couldn't internalize it because they lacked March 1, that got complement labeled. And then the B cells started pulling at them and plucking off all of these MHC peptide complexes by trogocytosis, and so that was the marginal zone B cells. And the dendritic cells basically fell apart or died because it was too much trogocytosis. And they came up, oh, where is it, where is it? I highlighted it. Um, they called it trogoptosis. <laughs> 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 so if you pull too many things off the cell surface, the cells are not happy and they die. And so the idea there is that you're losing the dendritic cells in the spleen of these mice that lack March 1 because 
they are being pulled apart or are at least undergoing too much trogocytosis that it's destabilizing their membrane and they die. So that's full circle back to <laughs> the original observation. But yeah, it's, it was a very interesting story the way they put it together because it was like, here's a cool observation, but we're not going to tell you why that's important yet. And here's another cool observation. We're not going to quite tell you yet why it's connected together. And here's another cool observation. And guess what? Here's how it all connects together in this complicated series of experiments, which yeah. are really cool. I, I do love the points you're making at the beginning about the idea that it, it's still blowing my mind, A, that the complement tickover is somehow being specific and used um, because that is not the way I normally think of complement um, when it's binding to host cells for tickover. So that to me is very novel is that complement binding to this host cell protein is useful for something. Um, and that there is this um, active or used in, for some reason transfer of membrane. This isn't just a cool, the the stealing happens because it's cool or for the sake of stealing, we're actually seeing a, a function here. Uh, and yeah. So I, I would, I would tweak that a little bit and I would say that it really is stochastic, the, the takeover, right? Okay. It happens. And the normal mechanism is to kick it off, degrade it, inactivate it, or in this case, internalize MHC, right? Because if you can't internalize the MHC, that kicks off this whole system. Does it happen in normal situation? We're saying like probably yes, there are hints of that. So it probably does play some role. But I think that that's all kind of happenstance that that happens. And then I guess you still have to have a rare event when a marginal zone B cell is going to come together and not every time it's going to pull one off. So it's going to be ex an exceedingly rare event but teasing out whether or not it's evolutionarily selected, right? Mm. Because saying it happens on purpose yeah. means that there was forethought and said, oh, I'm going to plan that. But whether that actually got selected or whether it just happens at a very low rate and we can observe it, but there's not necessarily a selective pressure for that to happen, I don't know. But it comes back to your original question of like how to – these marginal zone B cells get help. Mm -hmm. And maybe the only way they survive to be able to do what they do is because that actually happened at a very low rate. Okay. I don't know. It's just a, sort of the same thing you're saying, but kind of turning it on its head a little bit. I, I totally agree. I, I can tell I will be thinking about this paper for a while um, and yeah. trying to think about these mechanisms. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in the supplementary data too that I, you know, I didn't go through every single detail. But yeah, it's, it was, a, it, I liked the elegant experiments that they designed that enabled them to clearly show this was in fact happening when everyone's first thought is going to be, no way. <laughs> right, exactly. That's, crazy. That's very cool. I like that. Good story. Yeah. I was just looking for a, an icon to use for the, the uh, thumbnail. So I went over to BioRender, right? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Which I really love. In fact, Did they have something cool? They have did you, only... Did you search trogocytosis? Or? I, tr I searched, and there's one figure they have for trogocytosis. So let me... I can actually show it to you here. Here it is. It's trogocytosis of MHC2 from DCs to basophils. Huh. Hmm. Now the basophil acquires a, <laughs> an MHC... And uh, and this cell here is a uh, it's a naive T cell, mm -hmm. so it allows the basophil to present to a T cell, which I guess doesn't happen usually, right? I thought they were antigen presenting cells. Uh, yeah, okay. I, they do express MHC class two, right? I am not really sure about that, um, but that actually reminds me that in one of their earlier figures where they looked at the ability of different mm. cells to take they the did. label label. Um, I was surprised in particular by how much eosinophils um, picked up the label. Um, and I had, yeah. would not have expected that. Uh, so I guess that does tie into those basophils. Neat. I learned a lot. That was great. Thank you, Cindy. That was fun. It was fun. Yeah. It was, uh, and, someone and it's a team effort because that was a complicated paper. Yeah. So someone suggested you do this. Is that correct? 
Steph did. Yeah. Steph did. Okay. Yeah, and I think she was going to lead it. And then, oh, yeah, we realized oh. that the last minute that she couldn't. And so I was reading grants all weekend and I tried to put this together. Yes. I, oh, thank you. I, hopefully I didn't confuse everyone. I did a ton of bone marrow chimeras as a grad student and haven't yeah. really thought about them a lot since then. And so it was fun to um, get back into bone marrow chimera uh, experiments. And a lot of people used to do just, you, you, you put your one cell type in a mouse, and then you put your other cell type in a mouse. And then the question was always, well, what if it's the, you know, mm -hmm. something about the interaction? And so being able to use those different labels, and there's CD45.1 yep. and CD45.2, and there's actually other sets that you can mm -hmm. use too. So you can do mixed mixed, and so you can do all different permutations and put them all in the same home together and see how they interact. Yep. It's, it's, it's really it's a, lot a of pretty fun. powerful technique. Cool. All right, so mutant number 53, show notes are at microbe.tv slash immune. If you want to send a question, comment, immune at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. We exist on your support. Uh, you can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute, and anything you donate is tax deductible because we are a nonprofit, 501c3. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. And Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.